Welcome everyone to the Accelerance Thought Leadership Series webinar on A Blueprint for Finance, Constructing Internal Controls, Turning Risk into Rewards. My name is Joanne Brunn, the CEO of Accelerant, and I'll be your moderator today. So in just a minute, I'll be introducing our guest speaker, but first I want to go through our agenda and cover a few housekeeping points. I'll start the presentation with a quick overview of Accelerant and why we're including this important topic in our thought leadership series. And then we'll dive right into the main presentation, where Jennifer Eversoll will be providing strategies for creating effective and achievable internal controls and reviewing some potentially surprising rewards of implementing a successful control structure. Then I'll present a brief wrap up and we'll answer any questions that came in during the webinar. So all of your lines are muted. If you'd like to ask a question during the webinar, please use the question box on your GoToWebinar panel. We'll have a short Q&A session at the end of the webinar and we'll answer as many questions as we can. And if we don't get to your questions today, we'll follow up with you afterwards. So I'd now like to introduce our guest speaker, Jennifer Eversoll. Jennifer is co-founder and partner of Management Stack, an advisory and consulting firm. She's a graduate of Roanoke College, is a licensed certified public accountant in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and a recipient of the Virginia CFO Award. She serves on the board of directors of the Virginia Society of Certified Public Accountants and is a member of the American Institute of CPAs. She's a recognized industry expert in finance and organizational strategy, and we're pleased to have her back for her second presentation in our webinar series. I know that some of you joined us live for her earlier presentation on the business benefits of employee engagement and how the finance team can help create a culture of engagement. But if you missed it, you can watch it anytime on the resources section of the Accelerant website. So Jennifer believes that a great strategy coupled with a culture of employee engagement leads to more customer loyalty, better business processes, and improved profits. And it's a philosophy that we share. Accelerant's cloud-based budgeting and forecasting solution was created with engagement and collaboration at its core. Our product, Budget Pack, offers an easy-to-use interface to make a complex process accessible for all users. It was developed by former finance and IT execs who had experienced firsthand the time-consuming frustrations of budgeting and forecasting with Excel-based templates, and they recognized that the industry needed a solution that worked for both the finance team as well as the end user. We strongly believe that successfully engaging department managers in the budgeting process is possibly the single most important element in achieving a budget with accurate estimates and also increasing ownership of the numbers going forward. And ownership and engagement are two key themes you'll hear in Jennifer's presentation today. So without further delay, I'll turn the presentation over to Jennifer. Okay, great. Well, first of all, good afternoon. And I want to start by thanking Joanne and the team at Accelerant for inviting me to speak to you today about internal control frameworks. Internal controls are sometimes thought of as nothing more than just a necessary evil, something that just has to be done. But Accelerant is an example of a forward-thinking company that is focused on internal controls as more than that, as a critical success factor across the entire organization. So hats off to Joanne and her team for bringing this important topic to finance professionals today. Day. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and jump right in then. So the mere mention of internal control just often conjures images of red tape and bureaucracy preventing people from getting things done. And understandably so, the word control is right there in the name. And generally people just don't like things that try to influence or direct their behavior. Unfortunately, internal control has gotten a bad rap as a necessary evil that disrupts the work that needs to get done. Done right, however, internal controls are immensely valuable to an organization by helping to ensure that the company, its teams, and its employees meet their desired objectives. And there are some other surprising positive side effects of an effective internal control environment, too. So if you think of internal controls as nothing more than a burden, my hope is that you'll begin to see risk management through a whole different lens over the next hour or so. So what is the first thing that comes to mind when you think about business risks? 
My bet is that our minds typically go straight to thoughts of fraud or data breaches or natural disasters. And those are extremely important risks to guard against because any of those events would have an immediate impact on the financial results of the company. But companies often overlook internal controls surrounding the leading indicators of financial results. These are things like employee engagement and customer loyalty. Organizations that focus on meeting these business objectives that surround the leading indicators, including focusing on the internal controls in those areas as well, may just have the secret sauce for success in business. So let's explore how effective risk management, including a well-defined internal control framework, can do much more than prevent disaster. It can help your organization thrive. But first, I would love to know why you are joining us today. We have a poll question queued up, so I'll turn it back over to Joanne for a moment. Okay, so I'm going to launch the poll, and you can select um, one of the um, choices here, why you're interested, personal interest, to find out more about internal controls, to address, address challenges in the culture, or to learn how to implement controls in your company or some other reason. So if you could please select one, and I'll just give a few more moments for everyone to answer, and then I can share the results with everyone. Just a few more folks, and it looks like we got just about everyone. So let me close the poll and share it. Um, so Jennifer, we have one winner and a couple of others uh, that are close. Okay, great. Yeah, I see that um, most people or the majority of people who answered want to learn how to implement controls in their company. So that's great. I'm going to talk about internal control frameworks and hopefully give you a bit of a roadmap and where to get started. I know sometimes it's, it's kind of a nebulous or vague concept that you think, where do I get started? So hopefully, hopefully by the end we'll ha have some of those questions answered for you. All right. Great. So back to you then. Okay, great. Okay, so the things we're going to talk about today are a very brief history of internal controls. Um, we're going to talk about the internal control components, um, how to create controls without adding bureaucracy. We're going to talk about enterprise risk management and some surprising side effects of internal controls. But first, it's helpful to understand how today's most popular internal control framework, which is COSO's internal control integrated framework, came to be in existence. Let's start by talking about the early and mid-1980s. There were a number of significant public company failures, including Drysdale Government Securities, it was Washington Public Power Supply System, and that's just to name a few. Um, naturally, because of the magnitude of these collapses, a climate of scrutiny surrounded the failures. As a result, the National Commission on Fraudulent Financial Reporting was formed. It's often referred to as the Treadway Commission, and you may have heard of it by that name. It was established in June of 1985. And interestingly, this was a private task force. It was sponsored by a number of prominent um, organizations around the country. There was the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, the American Accounting Association, Financial Executives International, the Institute of Internal Auditors, and the National Association of Accountants. So that's quite a group. Um, the Treadway Commission's mission was to identify causal factors that can lead to fraudulent financial reporting and steps to reduce its incidence. So interestingly, again, it, the, um, the, it was formed in order to talk about uh, fraudulent financial reporting, but has since evolved into talking about how internal controls can be used for much more than that and can have positive effects rather than just preventing bad things from happening. Um, the Treadway Commission issued a what was called a report on the National Commission of, on Fraudulent Financial Reporting in October 1987. So they did the study for a couple of years and then issued a report. The committee made recommendations to public companies, to CPA auditors, and to regulatory agencies, most specifically the SEC. So first, they recommend recommended that companies address several areas: the tone set by top management the internal accounting and audit function, 
the audit committee, management and audit committee reports, independent audits, and quarterly reporting. So a lot about auditing in there. Then they recommended to CPAs that they change their audit standards, procedures, and communications to be more effective. Finally, the committee urged the SEC and other regulatory agencies to introduce new sanctions, impose greater criminal prosecution, improve regulation of the public accounting profession, provide adequate SEC resources, improve federal regulation of financial financial institutions and improve oversight by state boards of accountancy. So the SEC responded to each of the 13 specifically recommended rule changes by individually offering a response and either accepting or rejecting the recommendation. Um, this committee was taken very seriously. This article that I found from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazelle from May of 1988 is talking about how on the recommendation of the Treadway Commission that members of a congressional committee were scolding the chairman of the Securities Exchange Commission for failing to require the, that companies establish tougher auditing procedures. So this was taken very seriously. So the Treadway Commission was known by that name because the first chairman was James Treadway. Now the organization is commonly known as COSO, which is the Committee of Sponsoring Organization, and you may have heard of them by that name as well. COSO went on to publish its Internal Control Integrated Framework in 1992. COSO's Internal Control Framework provided a common definition of internal control as well as a framework for companies to use in evaluating their internal control environment. This framework went on to become widely accepted by U.S. companies and global companies for that matter. Then in recognition of changing business environments, um, they went back and said now since 1992 we've had increasing complexity, there's new technology, things have become much more global in nature, and they came back and updated their framework in 2013. Um, the revised framework didn't change at the core of what the framework looked like. It only built upon the original because it has stood the test of time and really is the most widely adopted. It's the most studied. It's been the most successful way to implement internal controls over the years. So like I said, the revised framework builds on the original and includes enhancements and other clarifications. So they added sets of principles to each component in order to clear up some of the previous sort of misconceptions or misuses that came along with it. So um, the one that we're using now or the one that we'll talk about is the COSO 2013 framework. So that's a little bit of history to show where it came from and how we got here today. Uh, but what are internal controls anyway? Internal controls are defined as a process affected by an entity's board of directors, management, and other personnel designed to provide reasonable assurance regarding the achievement of objectives relating to operations, reporting, and compliance. So COSO summarized their framework in a cube. So if you take a look at the cube, and it covers three objectives across the top of the cube. So these are sort of the different categories or what the um, internal controls are intended to cover across the organization. The objectives focus on different areas of internal controls. So these are sort of like buckets of controls. First, the operations objectives involve effectiveness and efficiency of the entity's operations. Next, reporting objectives pertain to internal, external, financial, and non-financial reporting. And compliance involves adherence to laws and regulations. Then you can see down the front of the cube, these are the five components of the internal control framework. They are control environment, risk assessment, control activities, information and communication, and monitoring. We're going to discuss these in a lot of detail because this is what provides that outline for the steps to creating an effective internal control framework. So this is sort of your roadmap on where to start with the control environment and how to sort of up and put systems in place to make sure the whole, the whole system remains uh, relevant. So then you see the third side of the cube represents the controls operate at all levels of the entity. So this isn't just something that starts um, 
enterprise wide and stays very high level, we need to take these internal control frameworks down to a unit or functional level for that matter. Um, so that's just to represent that these cross all levels of the organization. So with that said, let's jump straight to the five components of the framework that are on the front of the cube. So we'll start at the top with uh, the control environment. The control environment is the company's attitude towards risk. It starts with the tone at the top and then permeates through the entire organization. Uh, the board of directors and senior management establish um, expectations, they establish standards of conduct, and then it's management's job to support those expe expectations in their daily interaction with employees. So included in the control environment, if you think of things like hiring practices, so um, how, do you, how do you hire people and how do you find the right people and do you do training beforehand or do you expect people to come in already trained with certain certifications? Um, how are employees held accountable? Uh, what is your system of uh, performance reviews and how do you um, evaluate employees and those sorts of issues? What does the org chart look like? Is it very flat? Is it uh, very hierarchical? Um, and how authority and responsibility are assigned? But most importantly, it's the culture surrounding the integrity and ethics inside the organization. And another important factor in the control environment is the organization's risk appetite. You would never want an organization where public safety is a concern to have the same risk thresholds as an organization where innovation is critical to success. Um, in that sort of environment, risk taking is expected. Um, employees are expected to do things that are um, unconventional and, and a little bit riskier because innovation, that's where the innovation comes from. You wouldn't want that to be the case in somewhere that um, public safety is an issue. So that's why it's very important that leaders define and document the organization's risk appetite to be sure that everyone has the same attitude towards risk across the organization. So that's the first um, part of the uh, components of the the cube is the control environment. Next is risk assessment. Risk is all about uncertainty that affects an organization's performance. Risks come in all shapes and sizes and can range from unknown to well-known. They can be small, they can be monumental and affect the entire livelihood of the organization. Because risks are uncertainties that can adversely affect the achievement of a company's objectives, the first step in risk assessment is to identify those objectives. Objectives are the area in which the company must focus in order to achieve its vision. And they should span the categories shown across the top of the cube. If you remember on the top of the cube, we had the um, operating, reporting, and compliance. So um, when we're talking about operating objectives relating to the effectiveness and efficiency of operations of an organization, these objectives include operational and the financial performance of the company. The next are the reporting objectives. These objectives relate to how reporting is done both internally and externally and includes timeliness, reliability, relevance of information, whether it's financial or non-financial. For example, you might have an objective in this category of reporting that might be something about how we use collaborative budging across the entire organization. Um, another objective might be that budget inputs and outputs are reliable. Um, so you can sort of see how you have these objectives for what's going to help the organization succeed and they might fall in different um, areas across the top of the cube. The third category of objectives is compliance. All companies are subject to varying levels of compliance. Um, these objectives relate to adherence of laws and regulations and different uh, regulatory requirements. So even if you don't have a regulated industry of sorts, you still need to file your tax returns on time. You need to issue your W-2s timely. You need to calculate your withholding payments correctly and those sorts of things. So these are the objectives around uh, the compliance areas of the organization. So once um, objectives are established, risks to the achievement of those objectives are identified. So in the case of, say, NASA, an obvious objective would be to complete the mission safely and without incident. Or back to the leading indicators. 
that employees have access to the tools that they need to do their job. We obviously want these people to be very well trained and know how to respond in certain situations. So those, again, are objectives um, around the identification of the risks and the risks assessment. So once those objectives are articulated, the risks that could adversely affect the achievement of those objectives are identified. So then risk tolerances, which are the acceptable variances from targets in either direction are established. Then possible risk responses are formulated um, ahead of time so that if the uncertainty becomes a reality, the roadmap has already been drawn. Um, you don't want to get to a situation where something has happened and, and one of these uncertainties has, has come to be and you have to make all the decisions right then. We want to have already have a framework drawn and at least have a general direction on how we're going to respond to certain events. So the key point to remember here is that companies first have a balanced view of the organization when setting their objectives. Objectives need to span the categories on the top of the cube and cover both leading and lagging indicators. If the objectives span the organization, then the internal controls that are wrapped around those balanced objectives uh, the risk management efforts are going to also be balanced. So that's a way to get the balanced view of the risks in the organization and match those up with the objectives that also span the entire organization. So you can see we've talked about so far the control environment, the tone at the top, the attitude towards risk um, that permeates the organization, and then how we're going to assess the risks. We need to know what are the objectives that we're going to try to achieve and what are the risks that may prevent us from achieving those objectives. So now that we have those questions answered, we want to move on to control activities. So let's talk about Target for just a minute. According to a U.S. Senate report that was issued in March of 2014, Target failed to respond to multiple automated warnings from the company's anti-intrusion software that the attackers were installing malicious software, they were planning escape routes for the information they planned to steal from the retailer's network. It also said that Target gave access to its network to third-party vendors who did not follow accepted information security practices and that they did not isolate its most sensitive network assets, enabling attackers to move from less sensitive areas to places where Target stored consumer information. So that to me sounds like a lot went wrong there and there was a lot that wasn't in place that potentially could have been in place that may have prevented um, you know, millions of customers' information from being stolen. So they could have done this by introducing proper control activities in the organization. So control activities are those things that you probably usually think of when you think of internal controls. They're policies and procedures, even techniques or different actions that are taken to ensure that the control objectives that we identified in the last step are met. They include things like approvals, you have authorizations, verification, reconciliation, training, um, performance planning, those sorts of activities. So I'm sure we've all been in organizations or, or had situations where um, something's gone wrong and we need to implement a checklist to make sure that, say, it's a new customer onboarding and some information was missed causing an error. So then we implement a checklist that says we're going to make sure that we um, you know, verify this information is correct before we you know, turn the customer's uh, information over to wherever it needs to go. Um, that's an example of a control activity. Um, we have these all across organizations, up and down, and it's, it's those things that prevent um, the bad things from happening, essentially. Control activities can be either preventative or detective, and that's just what it sounds like. Preventative controls are designed to avoid the occurrence of events that can erode the company's value. So that's to make sure that to stop something from happening. Detective controls, on the other hand, are designed to identify when the occurrence of, of, of an event has happened as quickly as possible. So obviously, preventative controls should be of primary concern with proper balance of detective controls on the back end uh, for the proper secondary assurance. 
In our control objective example that we talked about in the last section on risk assessment, we, we talked about uh, control objective being budget, inputs, and outputs are reliable. So we may implement a control activity around that objective uh, to ensure that inputs are reliable, and that might be to include a training program for managers who provide the data. So in other words, we want the budget inputs to be reliable and correct, so our control activity is a training program for the managers who do that. So you can see how we're sort of wrapping the controls around the objective in order to make sure that it's moving in the right direction. Um, we might also have a mechanism for the managers to input the data. Um, on the flip side of that, a control activity to ensure that the outputs are reliable could be to employ a software that mitigates the risks of errors in the compilation of the data inputs that go into the final budget. Um, so those are all examples of the control activities that we can implement um, in order to make sure that the, the value of the company is preserved and, and more value is created. So now that we have our control environment set with our tone at the top and our objectives identified with the categories of risk around them and the control activities to make sure that, that everything is, that those risks are guarded against, um, we need to move on to information and communication. This component involves what mechanisms are in place for information to be obtained from both internal and external sources and then used to support the other contr internal control components. It also involves how information is shared and communicated up, down, and across the organization as well as even to relevant stakeholders outside the organization. In other words, it boils down to this is how information is disseminated to the right people at the right time. So since we've been using budgeting as an example, let's say that um, a manager learns that there's a significant change by a core vendor that's on the horizon. There needs to be some mechanism in place for the manager to report that information to everyone who may be effective, including the finance team, so that the forecasts and budgets can be updated. So both a culture of communication as well as the proper tools to disseminate that information are important so that everyone on the team is making informed decisions. We all know that risk is extremely elevated when people are making decisions without all the relevant information or they're making assumptions or they have inaccurate information. Um, that's when things tend to go wrong. So in order to facilitate effective communications, Organizations need to build a culture of trust. Uh, to me, that's the most important part of this. Employees need to feel safe to offer suggestions and bring previously unidentified risks to light. So if somebody's working on the front lines and they may see a risk that a lot of customers are really unhappy with this new feature in the software or this report that it hasn't worked or you know anything along those lines or maybe it's a certain product that the customers aren't happy with. They need to feel safe to go to management and to voice that concern and without fear of repercussions. This is one of the reasons that I think employee engagement is so important. Not only do they need to feel safe to to communicate, they need to feel motivated to communicate. Employees who are engaged genuinely want the company to succeed and they make decisions that help move the company forward even when no one's watching. Um, so we have that in place. So now again, we'll go through it again. The control environment is that tone at the top. We've identified objectives and the, the risks around those. We've got our activities in place that are mitigating that risk. We know how we're going to share information and get information to the right people at the right time. The next step in our process and the final um, component of the, the cube is monitoring. So internal control frameworks aren't something that can just be built and then put on autopilot. Controls need to be continuously reviewed because unmonitored controls tend to deteriorate. So we need to look at the whole system and make sure that everything is working as planned um, and see what updates and adjustments need to be made on a continuous basis. The control environment needs to be reviewed for two different ways. We need to look at it from two different perspectives. First, we need to make sure that the design of the, the control objectives and activities are suitable. Um, this is the we do this has always done it way syndrome. So I'm sure you all have seen it, I've seen it as well, hours, days, weeks, months of wasted productivity because someone is performing some control task that serves no purpose and should be obsolete. This, this is what happens when internal control systems are not 
subject to continuous review. So again, we need to make sure that the, um, that the controls that are being performed are actually guarding against the risks that they're intended to. Um, sometimes things change, but the control activity supporting it doesn't change, and then that's where you have the wasted time. Secondly, the control system needs to be monitored to be sure that the control activities are operating effectively. So this is where the testing comes in. We need to do more than just say, this is what we do. We need to check to make sure that it's actually being done. So this can be done by testing samples or entire populations. Um, there's a, a set of testing methods that's used by external, that are used by external auditors. They include things like observing the controls being performed. Um, inquiry, which just means talking to managers or employees who are performing the control. Inspection, which is looking at documentation that provides evidence that the control is being performed. Or even re-performance, which means actually re-performing the control activity to make sure you get the same result. And you may do that when you have some computation and you're just re-performing the computation to make sure you get the same mathematical result. Effectively monitoring controls will likely mean that internal control problems are identified and corrected quicker and information is more accurate. This of course will help to identify potential problems proactively rather than putting out the fires after something has gone wrong. So those are the five components of the internal control environment. I think now we have another poll question for you to make sure you're still with us and I would also like to know how formalized is your organization's internal control framework? So I'll turn it back over to Joanne for the quick poll. Okay, great. So let's poll the audience. I've just launched the poll. So now that you've learned all about what an internal control framework should be or could be, is yours very formalized, somewhat formalized, not very formalized, or not at all formalized? So let's see what people have to say. We'll give it a few more moments and a little bit more. Looks like there's a clear winner here. There we go. People are still thinking. All right. Let me close the poll and share it. Okay. So you've got the somewhat formalized 58%. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm a firm believer that um, as organizations change in size and grow and evolve, um, you know, when you're a startup, I think that you need to be agile enough that you may not want to have this very formalized control system, but then I think people quickly learn that as you start to grow, um, you may not know all of the employees or um, may not know what everybody is doing all the time, so that's when you begin to formalize it. So that's good to hear. All right, so let's go back to you then. Okay, great. Um, okay, so all companies have internal controls, whether they're documented or not. Um, for example, let's say that you have a business owner who sets the expectation last employee who leaves the building locks the door. That's an internal control that has been established. But just establishing that expectation is not enough. Sometimes information doesn't get passed on when new employees are hired, or sometimes there's room for misunderstanding of informal controls. Just because an activity is seemingly obvious to the owner doesn't mean that it's obvious to everyone who may come on board. In the case of locking the door, maybe the employee comes from a 24-7 operation where the doors are never locked or maybe they just wouldn't think to look around and see if they're the last one in the building, or they could even assume that the doors lock automatically. So something that's seemingly obvious to one person, we need to write down the instructions and make sure that they're fully documented so that when someone comes on board, you're really giving them the chance to succeed. So if nothing else, for the employees, it's giving them all of the information that they need in order to, to meet the expectations. Formalizing the internal controls into a framework is an important step and it involves way more than compiling checklists. The complete framework requires detailed analysis and documentation of those five components that we talked about. And just as no two businesses are exactly alike, internal control frameworks are unique to each business, so they can't be copied and pasted from one organization to the next. The process of building a complete internal control framework can be both time-consuming, it can be eye-opening because it requires leaders to take a deep dive into the inner workings of their organization end-to-end. -end. The fact is, 
know that this exercise is among the most important activities that most any business can undergo. It's critical in order to properly communicate management's ex expectations regarding the integrity and the ethical values. So that's the tone at the top, to identify the control objectives and those um, risks around those, to align the control activities so that everyone knows what to do to evaluate the, frame, evaluate the framework and to use the information for continuous improvement. So, Webster defines bureaucracy as a system of administration by officialism, red tape, and proliferation. Often internal controls and bureaucracy are seen in the same light, but it should not be that way. Internal controls should never, ever, ever lead to increased bureaucracy that prevents people from getting things done. Quite the contrary. Internal controls are there to help ensure that the objectives are being carried out, not to prevent them from being carried out effectively. So when determining uh, what controls to implement to support the business objectives, there are a number of things that you can do to create an effective system of internal controls that can walk the fine line between being comprehensive and practical. One thing that you can do is to prioritize risks so that the most impactful events are guarded against more heavily than those that are less severe. Also seek input from all levels of the organization. Organizations should keep an eye towards eliminating unnecessary controls, not just adding new ones. And finally, embrace technology in both processes and in controls. So let's start at the top of that list and talk about how to prioritize risks. A risk matrix, like the one seen here, can be used to systematically determine the appropriate risk response to uncertainties that can affect the achievement of the business's objectives. So how you go about creating this is it's a very uh, numeric black and white way, which as a finance professional myself I like to see. We're going to start by numbering the risks. So these are high level risks, um, things like business risk due to disaster or misconfiguration. Then you give the risk an impact score from one to five with one being the lowest impact and five having the maximum impact. The next step is to rate the probability of the event occurring from a scale of 0.1 to 0.9. So 0.1 means that the probability is remote, 0.9 means that the event is fairly certain. You multiply those out and you get a risk exposure store, a score. So now we have this numeric evaluation of the risks in the organization. So then we go back and plot those on a matrix similar to this one. So this is a simple scatter chart plotted in Excel, and it's based on those risk exposure scores that we saw in the risk evaluation. The risks are going to be addressed, uh, the ones that are going to be addressed first are going to be in the top right. That's the high risk range, that red range up there. Then we're going to go down and to the left as the risks become less likely and less severe. So we're talking here about how to keep from adding bureaucracy as you're adding controls, and this activity is all about perspective. So the events that are on the bottom left, the things that are low probability and don't really have that much impact anyway, we don't want to have the same efforts in risk mitigation as we do the ones in the top right, those things that are highly likely and will have a huge impact. That's where the bureaucracy starts to come in. So this one again is about perspective. So um, we want to spend our time mitigating the risks and align that with the risk itself. The second tip that I have for creating an effective system of internal controls is to uh, seek input from all levels of the organization, from the C-suite to the front lines. You can certainly get a lot of information from employees at all levels of the org chart. Those on the front lines likely have a unique perspective on what can possibly go wrong. So just having those conversations may shed light on the risks that would otherwise not be identified or addressed. Next, uh, we touched on this a little bit, but internal controls are introduced um, often in a reactionary way when something goes wrong. We have checklists, approvals, and they're implemented as a way to put out a fire, and that's necessary, and it's a good step sometimes, but over time, those processes may change while the controls remain in place, especially if employees don't understand what the controls are intended to mitigate. So if they're checking this box and they don't know why, they might just continue to do that long after the need for doing that has, has passed. So 
while you're implementing and then monitoring your internal control environment, keep an eye towards eliminating the unnecessary controls in addition to introducing new controls. So if we have a bias towards that streamlining, that efficiency, making sure that not only do we have controls for all the risks, but all the controls that we have are actually guarding against some risk. So listen for people performing controls to say that they do something again because it's always been done that way. Those are the ones that we need to look at and evaluate if they can be eliminated. Unnecessary controls rob people of time, they cost the company money in the form of lost productivity, and it's a sign of disengagement when you're doing something unnecessarily because you don't understand it. And finally, organizations should take full advantage of technology and automation, both in processes and in internal controls, to help ensure that the objectives are being met. Sometimes people can get a little threatened by technology, but our world is ever evolving. Manual tasks have widely been replaced by technology and automation, and that's a trend that's, not, that's likely not going to slow down. This only serves to elevate the role of people and judgment and thinking and ideas in the workplace. We have evolved into a society of more and more knowledge workers. So our knowledge is our, our intellectual assets now. So automation can reduce performance variances and processes that can increase consistency result in results. In an internal or an external audit setting, automation can also help to test entire populations rather than just samples. So it may be that if you're doing something manually, you can only check 10 out of 10,000 transactions. But through technology, often you can test the entire population for uh, variances, and, and that way you're getting a much more accurate picture of what's going on in the organization. So my tip is to embrace automation and technology and really use it to fuel your success. So let's talk for just a moment about budgets as controls since we've been talking about budgeting today. Internal controls are an important part of the budgeting and forecasting processes. So budgeting itself is an objective. Um, reliable budgeting would be a, a business objective and, and we have risks around that and gathering inputs and in the output so we want to have control activities there. So. Um, we talked about gathering inputs and calculations of outputs in the budgeting processes and how they should have controls wrapped around them. Inputs should be gathered from management across the organization. I wholeheartedly agree with Accelerant and Joanne and her team with, on that concept. Collaborative budgeting is definitely a critical success factor in gathering the information. It also is a critical factor in employee engagement. Um, it's very demoralizing to be handed a goal um, when you've had no input on the, the um, how accurate that goal is going to be. So while um, Excel is a valuable tool that has many benefits and calculations and data analysis, I would bet that we've all experienced errors in formula calculations and those can be costly and cause leaders to make decisions based on inaccurate information. So having a budgeting and forecasting system in place that eliminates the risk of Excel errors is also a valuable internal control. So. Let's flip that around a little bit though and talk about how to use internal controls in the budgeting process and also the existence of a budget as an internal control. So it in and of itself is a control activity. Budgets should be designed to be used as a benchmark against which results are measured. The financial results themselves don't mean much out of the context of expectations. Budgets and forecasts are a valuable detective control uh, remember we talked about preventative controls being the front end and detective being the back end. Um, they can shine a light on errors that may have occurred. For example, revenue that doesn't meet expectations could be evaluated and you may learn that there's a billing error. On the flip side of that, wage expense, if it's much higher than expected, um, much higher than the budget, that could indicate a payroll processing error that may have gone otherwise undetected. So budgeting is one of those unique areas where it is a control objective as well as uh, a control activity that can be used to um, mitigate risks across the organization. So I want to briefly mention enterprise risk management because you may have heard of that in conjunction with internal controls. Enterprise risk management is all about tying risk management to the company's mission and vision and organizational strategy in order to create a playbook for success. So enterprise risk management is the process of planning, organizing, leading, and controlling the events affecting the organization. So this is also um, derived from COSO. 
um, it incorporates internal controls into a broader system. It does not replace internal controls. It just is a way to use internal controls to tie risk management to organizational strategy. So that is a, a very quick talk about the definition of that. And I'll give you just a quick example. Um, if you have an objective in your organization that states that you're going to only hire people that have a certain job related certification. So we've identified that as an objective. Now we need to say what are the risks associated with that. Maybe we have a risk that we don't have enough candidates who qualify for that in the um, candidate pool that's available to us. So then we come back and say what's our response going to be to that. Maybe we're going to offer training internally and allow people to get the certification after we hire them or maybe we have some sort of training before we hire them and, and, and somehow offset the, the lack of candidates who qualify. That's part of the internal control framework, and that would be an appropriate way to use the um, internal control integrated framework. If we put that inside of an enterprise risk management environment, we're going to take that one step further and say, okay, the people in this pool don't have that particular skill, but maybe a lot of them have another skill that we could somehow capitalize on. So it's taking that and looking for opportunities as well as just mitigating risks. So that is a very, very, very brief um, distinction between enterprise risk management and internal controls. So finally, this is the fun stuff for me anyway. Um, in the last section, I want to talk about the surprising positive side effects of an effective internal control environment. In addition to mitigating risk, internal control frameworks have many great side effects that may challenge your traditional thinking about internal controls. The first is employee engagement. I've mentioned that a few times and it is counterintuitive that more internal control would lead to higher levels of employee engagement. And it is true that throwing layers of bureaucracy into a process when something goes wrong without organizing those activities into a framework, it can and most likely will demoralize employees. They may not have access to all the information that led up to the introduction of the control or they may not know how the control activity supports the key objectives. On the other hand, having the formalized internal control framework can boost employee engagement levels in a couple of ways. First, just by communicating expectations. Um, that's a critical part of the internal control framework that we talked about with the control environment. And that gives employees information and parameters in which to make decisions when unexpected things happen because we all know that unexpected things will happen. When employees know what's expected of them, and they're empowered to make decisions necessary to do their jobs, they are way more engaged with the company. Another way that internal controls can lead to engagement is by aligning the work that people do every day with the important things that drive success. As we talked about, a good internal control framework aligns internal controls with the business's key objectives, which of course requires that the company articulate those objectives. And one way to do that um, is by using a strategy map. So this is sort of a, a secondary to the internal control but somewhat loosely tied together because these are the things you want to wrap the controls around. Um, a strategy map looks at success from different perspectives across the organization, puts business objectives inside of that, then we wrap the control objectives and internal control framework around that. So um, that's a way to, when the control activ objectives and activities in the internal control framework are closely aligned with the business's key objectives and they move in tandem as the strategy evolves, employees have a clear understanding of how the work that they're doing contributes to the company's success, which has absolutely been proven to increase an employee's commitment to the company. Another advantage of a great internal control is overall cost savings. The lack of controls can be costly for, obvious reason, for an obvious reason, and that's fraud prevention. Um, that's why the, the Treadway Commission was formed in the, in the first place. And it's the 2002 movie, Catch Me If You Can, it's a true story about um, where Leonardo DiCaprio plays Frank Abagnale. He's a con artist and a master of deception. So he had was wildly successful at conning businesses and people out of money. So what does that have to do with internal controls? Essentially what he did was find holes in internal control systems of organizations, both large and small, and exploited them for his own gain. So it's clear that effective internal controls save money by preventing fraud. 
but they also save money in ways that may not be quite as obvious. Internal control systems also help to streamline processes and eliminate unnecessary controls, which saves money because things are running more efficiently. And even more savings are realized because things are more often done correctly the first time, thus avoiding the costly corrections that come with re-performing work. Not to mention that there are always going to be customers who don't complain to you if something isn't done correctly, but they complain to everyone else around them about what went wrong in their interaction with the company. And it's very easy for people to find large networks or audiences of people to complain to these days. So that leads us to the third positive side effect of an effective internal control environment, which is customer loyalty. The traditional way of operating a business just doesn't work in our digital world. Digital is about connections. Actually, they're exponential connections. Social networking has changed every aspect of the way any business operates, and never before in history has that change happened so fast. Customers are driving business behavior. It's not the other way around. And businesses are no longer the sole creators of their brand. Customers co-create them. And customers expect and demand and, quite frankly, deserve an amazing experience with every interaction. I personally don't have anything against American Airlines, but based on what I saw on their Twitter feed, a small portion of which is captured on the screen here, I may think twice before booking my next flight with them. In today's business environment, customers can often defect with the click of a mouse, and it is critical that businesses are able to respond quickly, completely, and correctly the first time. And when companies have good processes, which are supported by strong internal controls, they have the foundation to give customers the exceptional experiences that they demand. When they don't, the result can be catastrophic. And customer confidence, that's a huge part of customer loyalty. When customers trust a company, they are well on their way to becoming loyal customers. Trust is built by showing confidence and getting the job done the first time. This is something that has definitely increases significantly in companies with great internal controls. So with the right perspective, internal controls can be viewed as enablers of a company's business strategy. When a company defines their key business objectives, Internal controls can be right there by their side, underpinning the business objectives and helping to ensure that they are carried out. In the right business environment, there should be a clear link between internal controls and business strategy. To me, what all this boils down to is making both risk management and strategy setting an attitude in the organization, not just a task. As a default, when decisions are being made, the possible outcomes of those decisions should be checked against both the internal control environment and the strategy map to make sure that the decision will move the company in the right direction to achieve its vision. As the saying goes, every organization is perfectly designed to get exactly the results that it gets. So why not design your organization from the ground up so that from an internal perspective, people know the purpose behind the work that they are doing every day, and from an external perspective, customers have amazing experiences with every single interaction. So thank you so much for your time today. I'm going to turn it back over to Joanne for some closing comments. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. That was just great. I find your webinars are always just packed with really relevant, actionable information um, for all the financial teams in any organization. And I'm sure our audience now sees internal controls in a much more extensive way. <laughs> Thank you. And, I, and I like how you put it, that budgeting is both a control objective and a control opportunity. That was a really great, um, unique way to look at things. So I'm just going to um, wrap up here with a, with a few slides, just expand a bit on your presentation. Um, so Jennifer presented some of this um, potentially surprising, um, at least it was to me when I first heard her uh, webinar, the benefits of internal controls. And just following on that same vein, research supports that a collaborative budget module, one in which employees are empowered to make and be held accountable for important decisions, provides organizations with these same benefits, including increased engagement, motivation, and innovative thinking among, among employees, along with the business benefits of more accurate results, cost control, and improved forecasting. And similar to the keys for achieving a successful internal control structure, achieving a successful collaborative budget requires many of the same elements, two-way communication, documentation, 
employee participation, simplicity, and a balance of control with flexibility. So a few examples of these five keys. Um, technology that facilitates communication of the organization's strategy, that captures and documents the justification and rationale behind the numbers, that improves participation with a process that's easy for everyone, regardless of their level of financial expertise, and that provides the right kinds of built-in controls and approvals which enables finance to lock down key elements such as benefits or headcount while providing flexibility in budgeting methods like percent increase, line item detail, driver-based budgeting, and other budgeting methods. Because at the end of the day, when employees are empowered to outline their ideas for the wisest uses of funds, explain their reasoning, and have a discussion with their management about available resources and expectations, they really own their numbers and they take account accountability for their decisions. And this increase in ownership and accountability approves accuracy and helps to ensure that the budget is both a numerical expression of the strategic plan and an effective addition to your internal control framework. This is ultimately what all organizations, corporate, nonprofit, higher education, all of them are hoping for and the mission we're here to support at Accelerant. You can find more resources on employee engagement and collaborative multi-participant budgeting on our website, Accelerant.com. So it's time now to wrap up and move on to our Q&A session. So we have just a few minutes, um, probably can get to two questions. So Jennifer, the first question is that you mentioned internal controls as an attitude. How do you achieve this kind of cultural shift? Well, it, like everything else in an organization, it, stops with, it starts with the tone at the top. So it, it has to do more with, I think, um, walking the walk rather than talking the talk. So um, people need to see that business leaders are serious about this, that they believe in it, that they're passionate about it, um, that this is an expectation and not something that's just sort of the project of the day or the, the um, task of the month, that sort of thing. So it has to do with consistency and the way people um, are uh, communicating the tone and the attitude, the company's attitude towards risk. So it's really very simple to me. It comes down to um, executives really doing the right thing and showing people that this is um, the expectation and how things are going to be done at the company. Okay, thank you. And the, one more question. Which departments are typically responsible for internal controls? Well, it's different for different organizations, depending if there is a um, internal audit department, but really there shouldn't be one particular department that's solely responsible. We talked about the COSO cube and how there are three sides to it, and internal control should span the entire organization. So in our world today, functional silos are kind of going away, lines are being crossed, and people are working more on a horizontal rather than um, just in their own area. So it's really everybody's responsibility, maybe with an executive sponsor or um, an internal audit committee as a sponsor promoting it throughout the entire organization. So my answer there is it's everybody's responsibility. All right. Well, thank you. So we hope that everyone enjoyed today's webinar. Thank you again, Jennifer, for a fantastic presentation. It was informative and practical, and I'm sure our audience just loved it. Thank you. So please, please contact us at info at Accelerant.com if you wish to have a discussion about how our product can support and encourage collaborative budgeting in your organization and follow us on Twitter. And this webinar has been recorded and will be available through our website. And Jennifer's contact information is on the screen there as well. So thank you everyone for taking time today to listen to our Accelerant Thought Leadership Series webinar on constructing internal controls. Have a great rest of your day.